research that I've been conducting about my experience of teaching under lockdown. The images embody all that I've learned, unlearned and relearned in order to perform my role as an educator in the COVID world. The first square represents the pre-COVID education. I started with what I know. Everything's normal and functioning and what you see is what you get. It's just a square of fabric. The second is the square being picked apart, normality deconstructed, shredded. Everything is suddenly changed. And the final image is an, an, an attempt to reconstruct what is now called the, norm, the new normal, to relearn and create a fresh narrative. And here lies a conundrum. How can we go back to the square once it's been unpicked? For inspiration, let's turn to the second law of thermodynamics. It states that if the law of something breaks down, like a teacup falling off a table and smashing into pieces, or the deconstruction of my fabric square, that it can only be put back together with a huge amount of effort, and in the process, you increase the disorder of that system. So, a teacup can only be glued back together, but it'll never be the same teacup. And I could painstakingly reconstruct the fabric square, maybe, <laughs> but it certainly won't be the same weave. Its entire identity has been changed. This artwork represents my experience of the education system I'm currently working in. If its identity has changed so fundamentally, can we, will we, go back to the education systems we worked in before COVID? More crucially, do we want to? It's important to recognise that our changed state, the chaos of the teacup smashing, my square being deconstructed, is not a bad thing in and of itself. Instead, the disorder indicates that we've entered a liminal space. In my NSEAD conference keynote from last year, I explored pedagogies of uncertainty and how they support learning and teaching in the 21st century. And as part of that, I introduced Mayer and Land's seminal work on threshold, threshold concepts. This is a framework for teaching and learning, which indicates that a student who moves across a threshold from one state of knowing to another is changed by the process. And it has four key characteristics. The first is that new learning generates a significant shift in the perception of a subject or a concept. And in that sense, it's transformed. The previously hidden interrelatedness of something is then revealed. So we begin to understand the subject or concept from more than one perspective. This indicates that new knowledge is unlikely to be forgotten or unlearned, only through considerable effort, and that it frequently involves knowledge that is troublesome or uncomfortable for a whole variety of different reasons. Mayer and Land refer to this experience as entering a liminal space, where the student moves towards a conceptual gateway that comes into view during the learning process. As a result, a previously inaccessible way of thinking about something emerges. And so by passing through a liminal space, we can learn to see something in a new way. Now, it strikes me that it doesn't matter where we live and work, COVID-19 has forced every educational community into a liminal space as we deal with fluctuating dilemmas, uncertainties and expectations. We're all learners in this state. Whilst we bring a wealth of expertise and professionalism with us, the times demand that we find new ways to apply them effectively. Now this gives me hope. Unlike any other time in education, the disruption caused by lockdown provides each of us with an opportunity to build something different, something better, something together. Hope is generated through participation, and when it's invested in new experiences, it can help us move forwards. And so to my second question of the day, what do we want a new vision of education to be? Let's first remind ourselves of the troublesome knowledge that defines our current educational landscape, including all that's been lost, displaced and altered as a result of the pandemic. In March, there was just under 1 billion children across 102 countries experiencing lockdown, with millions of children across the UK learning remotely. The sacrifices made by the teaching profession in response have been nothing less than awe-inspiring. Schools have performed the role of childminder, food bank and social worker, alongside that of educator. 
Many of you have been in schools teaching, looking, look, t uh, teaching looked after children and key worker children. You've transferred learning online without any training time or additional resourcing. It's important to know that, note that distance learning is a bespoke field of pedagogy in its own right. It isn't something that can simply be picked up. Not only have you taught yourselves new ways to teach, but you're engaged in distance learning during a pandemic, often without a proper space to teach from, managing all of the safeguarding issues that working from home brings, as well as juggling the many different demands placed on us all during lockdown. I know how long it takes to teach remotely, and I know how exhausting it is. And throughout this, the teaching profession has demonstrated an enormous generosity of spirit, freely sharing teaching resources and ways of using technology to motivate students. And that doesn't even address the losses that you've experienced along the way, whether it's the inability to meet in person and celebrate significant achievements like my MA students in this photo, celebrating what would have been their graduation day last Friday, the loss of your holidays and the most essential time that you will need to recuperate after this exhausting time, or the loss of quality time with your colleagues and students. Some of you may even have lost colleagues to the virus. Thank you for your continued dedication and professionalism. It really is awe-inspiring. Guidelines to support uh, school preparations for next academic year are constantly changing as ministers across the four nations address this challenge with varying degrees of clarity. To be fair, the situation is pretty fluid, um, <clears throat> but it's also been made worse when policy decisions fail to draw on educators' expertise. At worst, politicians can appear obstructive, arbitrary, and policies are knee-jerk. Frustrations abound as school leaders attempt to balance governmental diktat, parental expectations, and staff and students' health, well-being, and safety. This is compounded by a sometimes hostile public mood stoked by negative media coverage. And through it all, NSEAD has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the safety and well-being of school communities as you welcome new cohorts of children back to school campuses. This is a really complex picture. So, Let's dig a little deeper. Data are beginning to emerge. This is specifically from an Oxford University study that is, is currently ongoing about how children's experiences of lockdown differ with those aged 10 and under on average experiencing more significant impact than teens. But of course, we know that this will vary depending on the vulnerability of the child. A primary concern is the range of trauma that children and young people have suffered. This includes a loss of access to their friends, of educational routines and rituals, of school as a safe place to go, or of children's only hot meal in a day. Let's face it, school is a massive part of children's lives. As the Restore Our Schools campaign reminds us, trauma is now a collective as well as an individual experience. Children's well-being and mental health must be our primary concern. The level of digital poverty exposed through lockdown is also deeply problematic. As you know, many children and young people do not have consistent IT equipment at home. They most struggle with affordable Wi-Fi access throughout the day, and many have little or no physical space to learn. Schooling during the pandemic is not an equal experience. Access to the most basic education has been lost for many. While schools have remained open throughout the lockdown, to support key workers, children and the most disadvantaged. National statistics from the 21st of May, which was uh, the week before half term, indicate that only 3% of children across England attended school that week. Stats that are corroborated by the National Foundation for Educational Research, or NIFA, who indicate that engagement with education is lowest in schools with the highest levels of deprivation. This picture is replicate, replicated across all of the nations in the UK. And whilst the DfE has indicated digital support for the most affected in England, currently half of all laptops promised have not been delivered to school communities. This really is not good enough. Adding to this troubling picture is children's access to different subjects using specialist equipment and resources. In art and design, many of our students have limited access to materials at home, let alone specialist equipment. And subject-specific engagement will be further exacerbated by the safe use of resources and equipment in the classroom. Use of everyday items like paper, paint and paintbrushes will continue to be restricted 
as teachers struggle to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in their classrooms. How this impacts on students' access to a broad curriculum remains to be seen. We cannot ignore this troublesome knowledge. Instead, trauma and inequalities must situate the heart of our education systems in the coming months. And what of academic accountability? Now, I think it's a misnomer to claim, as some do, that children haven't been learning during this time. We have all learnt much since lockdown began and children are not exempt. What they mean, however, is that children haven't been learning specific set knowledge and they haven't been tested on it. And considering this, I find it really interesting, uh, the abandonment of our exam systems. One of the primary preoccupations of schooling is tracking and measuring children's performance. But for the time being, the knowledge economy our education systems are structure, structured around have collapsed. In Britain, education is built on the commodification of knowledge, which is captured through data, or what Ball calls performativity. Let's face it, no one enjoys performativity. It impacts greatly on teacher workload, it controls our decision making, and can generate significant stress and anxiety in students. This is because the system is concerned with things, not people. It dehumanises us. Our education systems are experienced as something that is done to us, not something we're invited to shape. But for this year at least, we work in a system that places trust back in the hands of teachers. This is wonderful. We should celebrate this. Teachers have, been made some, have, have made summative judgments informed by evidence of students' performance during their courses of study. But as, as Rankin explains, next year, teachers, schools, universities and employers are expected to proceed without questioning the, the absence of exams. What does the suspension of GCSEs and A-levels of hires and nationals say about our education systems? That the commodification of knowledge through league tables and data-driven classrooms can be scrapped in the blink of an eye? I predict that this reprieve won't be for too long, however. And what are the young people who have been left in limbo? They were told that to, walk, to work towards these qualifications was a ticket to their future lives, and suddenly they hold absolutely no currency. Does this mean that the time and resources and human endeavour exerted in the name of data was meaningless? Young people have every right to feel angry. And what are those young people in years 9, 10 and 12? What decisions will be made on their behalf that they have no control over? And what will the implications of these decisions be on their lives? By investing so heavily in performativity, have we let down a generation? Interestingly, the appropriateness of GCSEs was being questioned in England before the pandemic hit. A poll conducted by the Association of School and College Leaders in March found that of the 799 head teachers polled, 86% thought that GCSEs should be reformed or scrapped. A key concern focused on the need for greater differentiation in exam papers for students of varying abilities, with a recognition that government reforms which deliberately made qualifications harder had resulted in unprecedented levels of stress and anxiety for vulnerable young people. And a campaign championed by Lord Kenneth Clark and made up of head teachers from state and independent schools is demanding a complete overhaul of performance systems. Now, I think this is really extraordinary. It's really interesting because Lord Clark presided over the introduction of GCSEs in 1988 as the Conservative Secretary of State for Education, and now he's calling for their abolition. Campaigners are calling for exams to focus on students full educational experience. Dismissing GCSEs is irrelevant and disruptive, especially as compulsory education is now extended to 18. Instead, they're arguing for continual formative assessment up to and including Key Stage 4 with exams at A-level only. NSEAD is pressing for high quality art, craft and design experiences for all next year. Although what and how education is accessed and assessed across the four nations remains to be seen. Whatever happens, I predict that it's going to be a significantly reduced offer. Will qualifications as we know them survive? I honestly hope not. I think we can do so much better. Now, 
If we're going to find a way to navigate the liminal spaces that we find ourselves in and emerge transformed, we must first understand our context, but from more than one perspective. Education in the UK is built on the assumption that information is the most important component, what Rankin calls the instruction rather than the, rather than the construction of knowledge. All models of education that are data driven are preoccupied with measuring information. Don't get me wrong, this kind of information, this kind of knowledge has its place, but it's not enough. It undermines children and, their, and young people's experiences, their interests and concerns and things that are relevant to their lives in the 21st century, and it underestimates them. It's one thing to define, to define knowledge, to know where to source it, but it's another to critically evaluate that information. This is where a performance-based system fails young people, reducing them to passive learners, consuming, memorising and repeating information under test conditions. It's become imperative that a transformative education supports students learning about the nuanced organisation of information. What's fake information? What's authentic? Are the first three Google searches the most current and reflective? Do they represent differing positions? And can these positions be constructed into an argument? How can you tell if someone has an agenda? What's the subtext? And how do we generate solutions to real world problems? Why, when the construction and deconstruction of knowledge is clearly much more appropriate for a 21st century education system, is repeating and testing information still more valued? To answer this question, it's important to unpick how knowledge is organised in society. There are many different theoretical models that we could draw on here, and I'm going to introduce you to one that has re relevance specifically to art, craft and design education. We're going to start in 1960s Paris and a piece of research conducted by French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu and his colleagues. They examined relationships between Parisians education, their social status and museum attendance to understand how politicians, curators and art historians influenced public access to culture. They found that education was at the heart of their results. Someone's educational experience, notably their qualifications and length of schooling, was more important in determining audience attendance and in museums than their social status, so it was secondarily to social origin or class. Bourdieu called this cultural capital. Now to unpick this, I'm going to look at two different interpretations of the word culture and how they interlink. The first definition relates to human beings. So culture can be acquired and the people who acquire it, acquire it are considered to be cultured and more cultured than others. A culture vulture, if you will. The second interpretation indicates that culture can be interpreted as an activity which is usually located in the arts. This refers to the cultural pro product that a person is cultured in. To be considered cultured, a person must engage in specific types of activity, and therefore some people are perceived as more cultured than others. Now these interpretations bring with them a whole lot of assumptions. For example, people need to be able to access culture in order to be able to participate in it. As we've already seen, this comes firstly through education, so how the curriculum is organised, which cultural activities are valued and so on. It also comes through socialisation or family behaviours, values and rituals that are instilled in us as we grow up. Do our parents value some cultural activities more than others? For example, is going to museums and galleries normal or something that rarely happens? And finally, access is also determined by economics. Can we afford to engage in the cultural activities that interest us? And so education, or what we call symbolic capital, social capital and economic capital, all play a fundamental part in cultural capital. The levels of exposure we gain in cultural activities inform how well we understand them and how motivated we are to engage with them. So if we never visit a gallery as a child, we may never think to visit one as an adult. Bourdieu argues that where a child has limited access to a range of cultural activities, disadvantage occurs. Here we can see that children's access and engagement with cultural knowledge is shaped by the forces outside of their control. 
So let's have a look at the status of cultural products in Western societies. High art or high culture is the most valued, at all, uh, most valued of all. And this involves things like going to the ballet, the opera or the theatre. In visual culture, fine art arguably sits in the pole position as it's perceived as more intellectually demanding than other visual forms. But why does this hierarchy exist? In the 19th century, a priority of museums was to educate the public by exposing them to, as Hooper Greenhill claims, the finest works that society had produced. This elevated specific artworks above the mundane and the everyday, and so high culture came to represent a separation of art from everyday life. In this lofty position, it stands in opposition to all other forms of culture, visual culture. And for those who exalt this high culture, the cultured person, the separation represents a detachment from the world that economic capital enables. Bourdieu describes the cultured person as living a life of ease. This also tells us that museums and galleries are not neutral spaces. They're structured around ritualized behaviors which exclude the uninitiated. How many of you have heard children say that a gallery or museum is not a space for them, that they don't feel welcome as they, as they lack confidence to visit? Regardless of cultural institutions' attempts to widen participation, they remain exclusive spaces, and none more so than the White Cube Gallery with its pristine walls, its hushed conversations, and artworks symbolizing the elite in society. The more difficult an exhibition, the closer it is to intellectual and cultural capital. These spaces are symbols for the struggle of cultural dominance by the privileged and the prominent in the art world. As educators, it's our role to break down these barriers. We understand that galleries and museums are rich with different meanings and messages, and by, engage, by changing the conversation, we can support young people and children to understand that this knowledge is not just available to them, but it's rightfully theirs to have. It's important to remember that much culture in museums and galleries is nationally owned. It belongs to all of us. And culture is not abstract or objective. It's a lived experience. I've chosen an image of Lebena Himid's artwork to demonstrate exactly that. Her works speak of race, gender and class. In some pieces, she deconstructs how some of our greatest artists, namely Picasso and Matisse, appropriated African cultures in their artworks, and she explicitly, explicitly rescues them, reclaiming her voice, her cultural identity, and her agency in response. Himid's work amplifies her cultural experience, and by generating curricula that embrace diverse lives, we can learn to listen to, to better understand the lived experiences of those with different stories to tell than our own. Reiterating and reinforcing NSEAD's anti-racist statement released earlier this week, in this way, we will disrupt racism. Therefore, those who perpetuate cultural capital uh, status are elitist. Worthwhile art is complex, suggesting the time and resourcing and education needed to engage intellectually at this level is not available to all. Those who hold cultural capital dominate the political realm, and far from being inclusive, they encourage divisions in social class, cultural participation, and production. We only have to look at the demographic of those who work in the cultural industries, where approximately 90%, just over 90%, are white, middle, and or uh, upper class, to see these divisions at work. One of cultural capital's main aims is to act as a means of differentiation. To achieve this, it must be perceived as a scarce commodity. Possessing capital is only useful because some possess more than others. Now let's consider the other end of the spectrum, uh, low or popular culture. It's widely available and cheap, is produced for the masses and consumed by the masses, and appeals to the widest possible audiences. Here, art and everyday life are integrated rather than separated. It's assumed to be unsophisticated, it appeals to base desires, it's a welcome distraction from boredom or the grind of work, it's fun, not demanding and serious like high culture, and so requires little effort from audiences. The implication is that popular culture is cheap, 
disposable, of no substantial or lasting value. This is why pop popular culture is rarely included in educational curricula. However, I think there's much that can be learned from popular culture. In fact, I teach modules about popular culture in education. I chose the selfie specifically here um, to represent popular culture in its, it, as it's ubiquitous, but it also disrupts the elite narrative. For example, there's been increasing concern that people no longer look at art when they visit galleries and museums. Instead, they use artworks as backdrops to take selfies. As Horning argues, museums are no longer spaces in which to experience art, but rather spaces in which to perform the self having art experiences. Potential damage may occur as people get too close, toppling artworks, as infamously happened a few years ago in the 14th Factory Gallery in America. In response, many museums and galleries have banned selfie sticks. Now, I'm interested in how the selfie represents a direct threat to the dominance of high culture. Last year, a museum of selfies opened in LA. It's an interactive exhibition more akin to a performance space where people can post selfies by responding to exhibits and posting photos on Instagram. In this context, the humble selfie democratizes high art by making everyone an artist, with artworks exhibited via social media. Do we need more of this kind of cultural activity to build confidence in those previously marginalized from museums and galleries? Possibly. The Museum of, of Selfies stands in contrast to the White Cube Gallery. Under the auspices of cultural capital, the more accessible an exhibition, the more dumbed down and irrelevant its content is perceived to be. Just remember the furore over the V&A's popular culture exhibition championing Kylie's golden hot pants. And so we can see that cultural products and activities are ranked hierarchically where those who subscribe to cultural elitism perceive high culture and the act of acquiring ca cultural capital as representative of high intellect. This is perceived as an exclusive and more worthwhile activity than engaging with popular culture, which is therefore indicative of a lower, lower intellect. In short, cultural capital is about snobbery. And we can see this operate in education. The model of controlling knowledge by attributing different status to curriculum subjects is enacted in education policies across the world, although status differs according to location. In some countries, there are hierarchies amongst the arts. For example, music may hold a higher status in the curriculum than art and design because it's perceived as more intellectually demanding or because it embodies a particular cultural identity or tradition. In other countries, for example, Wales, with a shiny new curriculum, the expressive arts have a bespoke pedagogic strand which stand equally alongside core subjects, health and well-being. How refreshing is that? Whichever education system we work in, it's important to remember that art and design educators are lucky. We can actively break down these cultural barriers instead of reinforcing them. That's why it's important to consider whose stories are championed in the classroom and why they are selected over any other. And so what are the culture that falls in between, what's commonly called middle brow? Famously, Virginia Woolf called this neither art itself nor life itself. And so it appears that there's no greater sin than to aspire to making high culture accessible and popular. It might be a bit clever, but it will never be genuinely challenging. And if you say you like middle, middle brow culture to a high culture junkie, it's akin to not having an opinion at all. In this sense, it comes across as aspirational, but inauthentic. Writing for The New Yorker, a magazine which has come to epitomize middle brow culture, Macy Halford argues that it plays an important role in the distribution of cultural ideas within and across societies. It achieves this by making high cultural ideas available to much larger audiences, using accessible language, popular imagery, and at little cost. This is particularly important for those who wish to engage in cultural experiences beyond their immediate context. In other words, middle brow culture acts as an educational tool, distributing knowledge in a more democratic way. I had quite a debate with my husband about choosing an image to represent middle brow culture and it was Eric who suggested that I use this image, the cover to the Sex Pistols single God Save the Queen. And he's quite right, it fits the middle brow culture criteria perfectly. 
celebrated artist Jamie Reed mixes high culture. Here we can see Cecil Beaton's photograph of the Queen, which is reproduced with a nod to Warhol's screen print, with low culture, newspaper print and the Union flag. Clearly these aesthetic choices are political and represent a disruption to the status quo. In this sense, the release of the single prior to the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977 distributes troublesome narratives to broad audiences across the UK and the world at cheap prices. A useful way to think about cultural capital and how it operates is to consider each category, low, mid or high culture, as indicating judgments of taste. Ultimately, these become traditions repeated so often that they become invisible, reinforced by cultural institutions, the media, education, politicians, our families, and us. What Borgia achieved through researching and writing about cultural capital was to make visible judgments of taste and how they influence knowledge distribution socially. So let's return to our liminal space. I've just addressed three characteristics of threshold concepts. First, I've identified hidden aspects of cultural capital at work, so we can begin to understand how knowledge is shaped from more than one perspective. Second, I recognise that this new understanding can generate a shift in our experience of cultural capital and how education is distributed in our schools. And finally, that this new knowledge is troublesome. The more we understand, the less we can sit by and ignore it. As educators, we're we are cultural gatekeepers. We play a significant role in breaking down cultural barriers for our students every day and so to achieve this we need to be conscious of our own choices, of our unconscious bias. I'm really interested in how the pandemic has fostered opportunities for a different conversation about cultural capital and the distribution of knowledge. Maybe through these conversations we can transform our thinking about education and seek a new way forward. I'm sorry if this is strobing a little, it's quite bright. Um, by inviting the British public to participate alongside established artists, designers and celebrities, Grayson, Grayson's Art Club democratises visual culture in an empathetic and honest way. For example, on a basic level, the fact that the art club was broadcast on TV made it widely accessible uh, as it reached a much wider audience than if it uh, had been held as an event in a gallery or a museum. The focus for the show was also a leveller by using art as a means to examine how people are coping with the pandemic. Conclusively, it amplified the general public's experiences through a genuine engagement with their artworks. Grace and Perry's conversations with members of the public are genuinely moving and through providing a space for active participation, he and Philippa Perry generated a virtual community across the country. The show crosses cultural boundaries. The public and their artworks are valued by a, success, by a successful artist, someone who represents the elite, a highly cultured person. By presenting alongside revered artists such as Maggie Hamlin, uh, Anthony Gormley and Jeremy Della, the public's artworks are legitimised, they're given the same curiosity, time and status. To make something is a means to understand something, in this case our experiences of lockdown, and to share these experiences with millions was powerful, it was courageous. Art and design's many intrinsic values were laid bare to, for and with the nation's public, and Grayson and Philippa's dialogue about the artworks, their experience of making and responding visually, helped us begin to make sense of that which we're all struggling with. In contrast to cultural dominance communicated through cultural capital, here the celebrated artist integrates art with life. One thing that stands out to me uh, above all others uh, from the art club was Jeremy Della talking about how the windows of our homes have become the new gallery spaces and whose artworks are displayed in these windows? Children's. In all of the talk of cultural capital children's artworks are overlooked but children use art to generate new meanings, to make sense of feelings and experiences just like adults do. You only have to see the artworks created by young people in NSEAD's Life After Lockdown project to see this in action. As a society, we've neglected children's culture, just like we neglect their interests and experiences in our national curricula. 
And so I've returned to my questions from the beginning of this presentation. Can we, will we, go back to the education systems we worked in before COVID? More crucially, do we want to? Emergencies matter. Far from occasions that justify suspending our principles, the way that we handle the extraordinary, the unexpected, sends a message about what we truly value. We are the teacup, we are the fabric square. Our identities and practices have been irreparably changed. And by being conscious of the liminal space, we can learn to see education in a new way. Now is the time to collectively explore what a better approach might look like, one in which everyone flourishes. Grayson's Art Club demonstrates how the pandemic has provided opportunity for democratic practices to slip through the cracks, to provide a space for community cohesion, empathy, listening and respecting each other's experiences. It has elevated the status of the amateur artist in new ways and as the cultural industries falter under the pandemic, community involvement in culture has never seemed so vital. Shouldn't we see the arts as essential to the recovery of the country and by extension, essential to the recovery of schools? And this leads to my second question. What do we want a, a new vision of education to be? I'd like to see a system that places an emphasis on a construction of knowledge rather than the instruction of knowledge we experience in our data-driven classrooms. This shift relies on our participation and collaboration, our willingness to engage with troublesome knowledge, not shy away from it. This challenges the story about elitism. Today, I've argued that cultural capital reinforces the control of knowledge for the few, but a collaborative and participatory approach to education repositions control. The elite becomes the person who can see through the superficiality of performativity and uses that understanding to create a genuine, authentic, caring approach to learning and teaching. And that person is you, the teacher. As educators, we're determined to do what's best for our students, to go that extra mile, but we're also exhausted. Let's underpin our recovery with a kinder approach that provides space for children's and teachers' experiences to be heard and valued. In a time of collective trauma, it's imperative that we honour our lived experience and, and bear witness to each other's by building space for critical conversations in a trustful way. Art and design is perfectly placed to enable these stories to be told. What will your story be? Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and as I've commented several times this weekend, the massive drawback of Zoom is that at the end of uh, an astonishing presentation, we have silence. But I know <laughs> that there's deafening applause out there, um, and we're certainly seeing it coming through on the chat. Booming applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you, everybody. I, I'd love that was to nerve wracking. Sorry, I was a bit nervous, but. <laughs> I'd love to do an experiment and just um, unmute you all one by one uh, and do a context because <laughs> we might try it before we, we, we go, who knows. Uh, but we have got time for questions yeah. um, and what I'd love to do, Rachel, is um, invite uh, a, a few th folks who've put the questions in the box to uh, speak directly to you. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to kick off with past president Peter Gregory who has a, a fabulous question for you. So Peter, I'm about to, um, to bring you in and hopefully we can hear you. Hi, Peter. Oh, Peter's microphone is off. We might, <laughs> we might not get to be able to speak to Peter. We may have to speak on his behalf. Okay, we will speak on Peter's behalf. It would have been lovely to hear his voice, but there you go. Um, Rachel, Peter asks you, which model of cultural capital do you read in the Ofsted inspection framework? And do you think it's going to survive COVID-19? Uh, interesting question. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think that I, I think that the Ofsted um, approach to cultural capital is really um, um, difficult primarily because they don't define cultural capital explicitly. Uh, they expect schools to interpret uh, what, what 
however they want to to perceive cultural capital i think that that is really problematic because it leaves a, a vacuum schools are uh, interpretation of cultural capital therefore may be different to an ofsted inspector's interpretation of cultural capital so i think that's uh, that's our first problem um in in trying to unpick uh, uh, Ofsted's position in terms of cultural capital. I think probably what they're referring to is how much access to a range of cultural experiences children have and how varied those are. Um, so I, I would say that it's 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 taken probably from from uh, a, a positive place, um, but I don't think that's explicit in their documentation. Well, that's great, and, and Peter can't tell us if he's happy with the answer. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. We've got a couple of people uh, asking you, Rachel, will, uh, will they be able to get some of the uh, references um, yeah. and notes? And just to make everyone aware, members will be getting transcripts from, from this session um, or, or, or slides, certainly. We will make sure that you have all that you need. Um, I'm going to bring in Claire Stanhope, who uh, sits on our Cultural Capital SIG Special Interest Group. Uh, and hopefully Claire's got a mic, if not, I'll speak for her, but it'd be much nicer to hear from her directly. Bringing you in, Claire. Possibly not. She's on you. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Claire. Hi, thank you. That was such, such an inspiring talk, and um, I was sort of nodding and shouting along with you. Totally. It was brilliant. Um, thank so you. My question is um, It's totally true that art, craft, and design curriculums must be disruptive and um, welcome a diverse range of communities. Um, but how do we as educators make sure this is not tokenistic and um, that our curriculums are de developed through an anti-racist methodology? And do you also think there needs to be a revision of how we actually formulate the structures that support our teaching? So, um, for example, schemes of learning, for example. And if so, what would that look like? Wow, lots of questions. Okay, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, I'll go with the, could you remind me of the first question? Um, how do we make sure it's not tokenistic and that yeah. curriculums are developed through an anti-racist methodology? Yeah, okay. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, making sure that it's not to uh, tokenistic, I want to draw on the discussion that happened yesterday in one of the sessions yesterday by um, Maria Amadou and Janice McGuinness and they were talking about in their Navigating with Kindness session, they talked specifically about the importance of starting with the individual, so starting with your own value system. So I think in order to begin to address this, we need to um, consider, we need to take a bit of time to reflect on what our values are individually and then uh, consider how we can perform those values uh, in the classroom. That will partly be, I, I guess, in reference, if you're working within a department, you're working with other colleagues, you might want to ask colleagues to do the same activity and then come together and think about where are the shared, where are the overlaps and what are the shared values that you have. I think, I think it's very um, easy maybe to um, say one thing and behave in another way. So in order to, you know, in order to make sure that the, that the, that the that the actions that you take and the words that you say have meaning and that they are uh, adequately uh, appropriately performed within an edu educational space you need to know what those values are in the first place so that's that's the first thing i would say is that you start with the values and then you begin to think about how that operates within a within an edu educational setting with your colleagues um, and how you prevent that from being tokenistic in terms of um, um, uh, 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 the anti-racist agenda is, I think it, it, it also partly comes down to language. So thinking, uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's very easy just to um, add diverse uh, artists and designers and craftspeople into the curriculum but without really un unpicking their lived experience. So I think we need to examine the meanings and messages behind the work that is uh, that we're, we're presenting and not just use it in a tokenistic sense. So we have to unpick what the artist is saying and why they're saying it and what context they are operating from uh, so that we can gain a better understanding of, of of their lived experience. I think that's really important. Um, and I think we also then need to unpick our own language and the language use, we use to describe that. Uh, so I would say those are two 
possible approaches or ways of beginning to address this agenda without being tokenistic. In terms of the pedagogy, I, I see um, curriculum and pedagogy, have, you know, they sit hand in hand. We can't have, a, you know, decolonize the curriculum without addressing the, the way that we deliver that. Um, so I, I, I hope that, you know, thinking about the content in more depth and thinking about the language you, we use to describe that content in, in some way helps go towards answering that. I think as well, I mean, as, as members, you have access to my keynote from last year where I focused specifically on pedagogy and I was looking at um, uh, a pedagogy of uncertainty and how we generate uh, you know the importance of generating ambiguity ambiguous spaces within the classroom and how we support young people and children to embrace those ambiguities and to use them in order to construct new knowledge and to examine and reconstruct and, and deconstruct knowledge so uh, uh, anybody who might be interested in thinking about alternative pedagogic approaches i would welcome uh, uh, you go and have a look at, uh, at my keynote from last year I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. I'm going to bring in Deersley now. He had a really interesting comment, which hopefully will be a, a good question too. I'm going to bring you in, Deersley, hopefully. But we shall see. I'll mute at the moment. And we've got. Hi, yes, I'm here. Hi, Deersley. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, sorry, my question I'd written earlier was just about, um, because I've been uh, listening to some recent podcasts uh, with um, Oliver Cavioli and about dual coding and just like the metaphors that some of the things you were using with, um, you know, sort of like higher art, lower art and just, it's, it's really made, I think we've got um, in recent times you know become very acutely aware of the kind of language that we use and it's just fascinating to me whether any research you know has been done on on the kind of like words that we use with children when we talk about artists or we talk about periods in art history as whether you know how how we can allow our words to access it um I don't know if I'm making much sense. Is that okay? Yeah, yes, you are. And I, I, I have a feeling, Michelle, you might want to come in here. Wasn't there, isn't there a piece of research that is being conducted through UCL? Was there, yes. were we approached to be involved with a piece of research that's looking exactly that at children's use of language in the art classroom? Yeah, exactly that. And hopefully uh, there will be some preliminary uh, findings from that that we'll be bringing to an event in, the autumn, uh, it was going to be a live conference, who knows now, it might be one of these, um, looking at, at those themes. So do keep your eyes out for that. Yes, thank you. Okay, lovely. Um, we've got a kind of interesting uh, question uh, up here and it's it's from Oliver Nicholson. Um, I'm just going to quickly quickly read this one and it's actually about your your MA artist teachers uh, slideshow um, and Oliver asks do you worry that all six of your MA artist teachers are female is this typical and does it matter I think it's a great question it is a great question and yes it does matter and yes it is an issue <laughs> I have although I have to say that um, uh, for the new cohort uh, we have um, uh, three uh, male artist teachers joining us, which is uh, in one cohort, I think that's in a cohort of 10. Uh, and, I, and I see that as, as a, a huge success. Yeah, it's a massive problem. Yes, absolutely. Diversity and uh, inclusive voices is, is, is an issue, but I think that's replicated across uh, the teaching profession as a whole as well. Yeah. Uh, certainly an issue that NSEAD has been um, alive to and, and active uh, with for, for a very long time. It's a long-standing issue. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Susan as well. Should education um, become co-constructed between teacher and student? Yeah, I think that's a, I, I think that's a really interesting point, Susan. And yes, I do. I think, I think that young people have a huge amount that they can contribute to the curriculum and to pedagogy so both in terms of the way that they experience their learning and what is is learned i think they you know 
they can bring such a wealth of experience and we need to be listening to their experience. We need to bring their lived experience into the classroom and, and a co-construction really, a kind of a co-constructive pedagogy really enables that in a, in a kind of a, a, a dynamic way. So yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, and from V Snares, now V Snares, I don't know your, your first name, um, asked about high, middle, low brow judgments of taste. Um, are you referring to aesthetics? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, yes, I'm referring to aesthetics, but I'm also referring to um, so cultural products and the way that they're constructed. And uh, but that but that relates to all kinds of visual culture. So I mean, I, I if I give you an experience of of something that's not uncommon with my MA students, I might have someone who comes in. Um, who has uh, studied textiles, for example, at university uh, and comes in and wants to develop a fine art practice and feels a real kind of um, a lack of confidence in their ability to present themselves as artists and they feel that they feel disadvantaged because they haven't done a fine art degree so in a sense it's talking about uh, aesthetics but it's also talking about the the experience that somebody has of um, being part of a, a kind of an elitist system great and um, there's one here from uh, someone we don't have their name uh, so I can't bring you in because I don't know where you are uh, would recent issues with sculptures be seen as middle brow activity? <laughs> uh, I think it disrupts actually. I think it fits more into the, 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 the position of the Grayson's Art Club because it's, de it's democratising a debate. It's, it's highlighting things that are otherwise hidden um, and it's, it's starting a different conversation. So I think it disrupts the, uh, the elitist narrative completely. I, in a sense, middle brow does disrupt the, the narrative, but it, I think it's, do you know, it's interesting. I was talking to, um, uh, I work closely with the Pitt Rivers Museum and they have, as, as many of you will know, a very complicated relationship with, uh, with our colonial past. And uh, it looks like um, they're going to be taking down the Cecil Rhodes sculpture um, in Oxford, at Oxford University, and it's going to be in the Pitt Rivers. It's going to end up in the Pitt Rivers, which is going to spark some really interesting alternative con conversations about decolonization and multiple voices. Um, and I, I think I think that the, all of the, the the current kind of conversation about about statues and our colonial past is um, is timely. This is yeah we should be having these conversations we should be disrupting these narratives yeah and we're almost to time um we've got loads of questions actually and uh, i'm going to sort of take those two to, to look at beyond the session so thank you everyone for these questions they're in, incise insightful and incisive uh, i want to just give the floor to one final one though because i think uh, as educators and for you particularly thinking about um, teacher education i think it's uh, it's absolutely pertinent one to finish with. It's Esther Tyler Ward, and I'm going to just bring you in if I can, Esther. Otherwise, I'll, I'll read you read your question to Rachel. But let's uh, let's see if we can get you in. And we've got Esther. Hello. Hi, Esther. Hi. Nice to speak to you. Um, so my question was: um, as a new trainee art teacher, um, what is the most important thing to take on board and embed as part of your practice and pedagogy that and not get sucked into you know traditional um what art should be in schools does that make any sense yeah it does yes absolutely um i i think it's important for you to um talk to the children about what they about their experience of art so for example you know on your your first day with a with a new cohort what do they want their art experience to be what do they want to study what experiences do they want to have and how can you incorporate that within your um your your planning and your delivery i i would start with the students voices thank you brilliant thank you and yeah so many questions but uh, we'll have to take them beyond the session thank you all it just remains for me normally at this point in conference or formally 
proposing a motion of thanks to our president uh, for all the work this year um, and particularly this afternoon um, so take that as read Rachel thank you so much for us to think about so much for us to take away and reflect upon and then act lots of people have said this weekend that our words matter we have to choose them with care this is a very wordy medium um, it's been about conversation it's been rich but in the end it isn't what we say as Rachel says it's what we do we have to translate this to action we're looking at our unity of values we're thinking about how to amplify voice and now we've got to work on what that collective action is going to be so you've inspired us You've rallied us, Rachel, um, and we will see hopefully lots of you back for the final session of conference, uh, looking uh, in depth uh, at, at different perspectives on cultural capital, and that starts at three. So for those of you booked onto that, we'll see you then. Thank you all, and have a lovely afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. I'm going to look forward to reading, looking, looking through them and reading them. <laughs>